Good evening and welcome to the call with Edelweiss Mutual Fund, wherein, along with JP Morgan Asset Management, we would be sharing insights on the China kit. I am Shikha Sood and I lead mutual fund products at Edelweiss. China is indeed a very dynamic and eventful market. China has had its own set of uh, challenges, geopolitical tensions, aging population, and the resultant FI outflows that we have noticed of late and uh, also the subdued uh, consumer and private business sentiment. Despite that, I'm confident that most of us on the call would acknowledge that China is at a very interesting juncture at this moment. And uh, why do I say that? So for me, uh, probably three points uh, stand out. The first one that intrigues the most is its uh, evolving growth trajectory. Transitioning from a, from a manufacturing to a services-led growth model from being export oriented to now focusing on growing the domestic piece and also on being self-sufficient. So this is something that is interesting. More importantly, over the last couple of months, we have noticed that the government is being intentional in, in sending the message out that China is now open for business and it's transitioned to a more growth friendly policy stance. The second part that uh, interests most of us here on the call today are the valuation levels. The multiples are now trading at 30% almost below their long-term averages. So therefore, very attractive levels for someone considering to enter or even add on to China investments. The third piece, of course, is the investment opportunities. So while we have attractive valuations, so what about the opportunities available? So there are, we are noticing that couple of, or in fact, quite a few unique opportunities uh, across the uh, new age technology, renewables, et cetera, and which are very specific and unique to China. And these are uh, showing good prospects, even in terms of earnings potential. So that's interesting. So to delve deeper into China and uh, to apprise us on the on-ground reality, we have with us today from JP Morgan, Tai Hui, Chief Market Strategist, APAC, and Supreet Ban, Head uh, Southeast Asia Funds. So thank you, Supreet and Tai, for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Shikha. So just to lay the context for the call today, Supreet and uh, Tai, uh, China has gained significant interest over the last couple of months, specifically uh, starting this calendar year. And it's, uh, we can notice that a lot of our investors and distributors here in India are interested or are looking at China investments, specifically uh, to diversify beyond their India assets. So the key question really remains that um, is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, should China be looked at as a tactical or a beta play or is China the long-term investment allocation? Uh, also, what would be, uh, also what would be the possible drivers that would lead to a rebound and uh, recovery in uh, of China markets from instilling consumer and private business uh, sentiments and confidence in them to also confidence in uh, investors at the global level. So we look forward to an insightful conversation. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Over, over to you, Supri, for taking the session ahead. Shikha, thank you so much for having us. And uh, thank you for those generous opening comments. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate your time uh, this afternoon. Uh, Shikha did a great job of teeing us up with the agenda. And uh, we certainly hope to make this an insightful session. Uh, the way we're going to run this is, and let me give you a little bit of a context. Ultimately, the access to this really exciting yet volatile market of China is through the Edelweiss Greater China Fund, which invests into the JP Morgan Greater China Fund. So uh, for the bulk of the discussion today, we will focus on the majority of the product, even though it invests in Taiwan and Hong Kong. We just take Hong Kong as a proxy for China. And of course, uh, a good two thirds of the product is invested across uh, Chinese uh, markets, whether it's onshore or offshore. So uh, for, for the bulk of the discussion today, Tai and I are going to focus on our comments and views around China. But if you do have questions on Taiwan, which is almost 35% of the portfolio, we're happy to take that in Q&A and I'll try and address that in the segment on uh, where we focus on the fund as well. So the way we're going to run this is I will invite Tai, my colleague, uh, Chief Market Strategist for APAC, based in Hong Kong to give us comments on, on the Chinese economy, Chinese markets. And hopefully once you've done a decent enough job of setting that right context, I'll try and tie that into the actual portfolio that's available in the form of the Greater China Fund, which is Edelweiss Greater China Fund as well. 
If that sounds reasonable, let's kick off. I do want to mention that uh, we're coming off of a very auspicious period in China, which is the Chinese New Year. I want to start by wishing Tai a belated uh, happy Lunar New Year, Tai. Thank you, Supreet. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to share our thoughts on China, both economy and markets. I, I do want to congratulate Advice for this call because, um, you know, interesting enough, this is the first call on China I've done for some time. And uh, interesting enough, in the next few weeks, I've got a number of, uh, you know, clients also lining up to discuss China, both in Asia. I've got a call next week with, uh, with clients in the UK. So, I think from that perspective, yes, it's been quite challenging uh, investing in Greater China for the past couple of years. Uh, but I think the as, uh, as both uh, Shika and uh, Supreet mentioned, the valuation proposition is starting to pique interest with a lot of investors. So uh, I do look forward to our discussion. And again, thank you for your best wishes. So for those of you who uh, don't follow the Lunar New Year or the Chinese uh, zodiacs, this, uh, this new Chinese New Year marks the start of the Year of the Dragon. And Year of the Dragon, interestingly, symbolizes a characteristic such as strength, wisdom, and success. It's safe to say that the global markets aren't assigning these as virtues to the Chinese economy or the markets for the past two to three years. Why don't we start off with your comments on what's been going on over the last three years and why, indeed, it's been really challenging navigating yeah. both the economy as well as the market as well. Uh, no, absolutely. I think it's, uh, a lot of things have not gone well for China. Uh, so if I move on to the next page, please, on page two. Um, so we did a snapshot of uh, market performance from uh, late 2020 all the way to where we are now. And obviously we did have the pandemic, but that is only part of the story. If you look at late 2020, 2021, um, we've seen quite a bit of uh, regulatory reform, especially relating to the tech sector, where there's anti-monopolistic behavior, how companies um, uh, treat their workers, uh, all of which has created quite a lot of challenges for the tech sector, which you know, for the past decade has been leading the way, driving uh, the Chinese markets, both onshore as well as offshore. And then it comes to 2022, um, the COVID pandemic has created a quite a uh, stringent lockdown across the country that clearly had an impact on the broad uh, macroeconomic developments uh, both in terms of consumption, but of course, in terms of business investment. Uh, I think that, again, creates a challenge for, for 2022. 2023 is really a year where uh, we did get the reopening uh, of the economy from the pandemic. However, at the same time, uh, the government has been trying to cool down the housing market uh, because, frankly, you know, before COVID, a lot of people in the big cities like Beijing, Shanghai, they were complaining that property prices were too high, they can't afford it, or even, uh, even if they struggle to rent, and therefore the government put in quite a bit of restrictions in place uh, to cool down the property market, to bring prices down, and that in itself created some new pressure on the economy. At the end of the day, a lot of consumption, a lot of investment, a lot of uh, local government revenue is dependent on the property sector, and all that created a significant macro headwind uh, for the economy. So from that perspective, I think it's a combination of both short-term and longer-term policies that created the, uh, the challenges that we face in the Chinese market. And of course, uh, you know, geopolitics between the US and China has always been an issue. And again, I think uh, a lot of the export restrictions that we've seen being imposed on China, that also uh, created some concerns with international investors on China as well. So all that put together, it did mean that both uh, the offshore market as well as the onshore market went through quite a challenging time uh, in the past few years. So, uh, you know, the, the reason that uh, that slide was so busy with text was perhaps how how frequent some of those regulatory or those developments have been, right? Which, which is exactly why, why markets have performed the way they have. And uh, we've seen the kind of drawdowns that we've seen. So, you know, just a very, very busy slide speaking to the frequency of some of these regulatory moves or market moves, or to your point, geopolitical points as well. That's right, so, so sorry. If I just share with you a little bit more in terms of details. So just move on to the next page, please. 
So um, you can look at what happened in the past few years in terms of investment. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll find that the dark blue line, the real estate investment, you can see that is going through still quite a bit of a correction. Uh, you can see manufacturing, infrastructure. Infrastructure has always been the, the, the pillar of how the government trying to kickstart the economy by building infrastructure. And you can see that's been doing quite well. But I think the one of the soft spots that we've seen is very much the real estate sector. And then if you move on to, move on to the next page on consumers, I think, you know, it's interesting that if you look at the left-hand side, Chinese consumers have built their deposits. And in the U.S., that was seen as great. You know, U.S. consumers have more deposits. They can spend more. Uh, but in the case of China, there is a difference because you also notice that uh, Chinese consumers uh, or households have reduced their borrowing. So they've been deleveraging. They've saved up because the job market wasn't going great. They're on the right-hand side, you see that the property prices and the stock index have been coming down. So there has been some negative wealth effect as well. So, you know, while in the U.S., uh, excess savings because the government's been like throwing money at the households in China, that didn't happen. It was saved via their own income. So from that perspective, I think consumer balance sheets is, is strong. But that also means consumer spending is becoming a little bit more cautious. So, you know, we just had the Lunar New Year holiday. We've had record level of travelers, but per capita spending has come down a little bit relative to pre-COVID. So what you see here is that people are still willing to go uh, overseas or domestic holidays, but uh, for their holiday, they're spending just a little less. Uh, they're a bit more value conscious when it comes to spending. Uh, the final point, property market, as I mentioned earlier on the next page, uh, you find that property prices come down. Um, it depends on where you are. I think if you are on the second and third tier cities, uh, obviously things have been a bit more difficult, but we are starting to see some catalyst of change for the better. Uh, a lot of the um, home purchase restrictions have been lifted or relaxed. Uh, it's easier now to get a mortgage. Mortgage rates have come down. So I think the government, from a policy standpoint, is starting to provide the conditions for households to get back into the market. But I think there are two things that will, you know, persuade them to do that. One is obviously price expectations. You know, if I'm expecting property prices to go up, obviously I will look to buy now. But at least for the time being, I think households are still taking a slightly more wait and see approach. They say, well, you know, maybe price will go flat, maybe go down a little bit. Let's just wait and see where we get some real momentum coming up. Then we'll get, get in. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, is about developers. Because when the property market cools down, you can see that on the right-hand side, construction has been coming off. Um, what that means is some of the weaker developers, they may not be able to finish their projects. And that's a big issue because what happened uh, often in China is that I will pay a down payment, I get a mortgage, I'll get my property de delivered maybe in 12, 18 months, 24 months time. And if it doesn't happen, I borrowed already, uh, I don't get my property. So I think lots of um, potential buyers are also thinking about how developers may or may not deliver on a property. And again, the government in the past few months, they've established this white list of projects that you know, they encourage banks to lend to these projects to make sure that they will be delivered. So again, there's been lots of uh, monetary policy, uh, relaxation in, in the rules and regulations in trying to bring some momentum back into the property market. So overall, things have been quite challenging, but I would say a lot of the policy support are starting to fall in place to facilitate the recovery, may not be right away, but over the course of the next six, 12 months, we should see some stabilization. So that was great, setting the context in terms of what are the challenges, headwinds, uh, and you know, starting off with a very busy slide of some of those regulatory as well as geopolitical issues. Uh, you spoke about how the economy is in a state of funk right now because of the property market as well, and what could perhaps bring it out of there as well. But Again, it is a very relevant economy, Tai. It is the second largest economy globally, and more importantly for investors, its capital market is still the second largest capital market at about $11.5 trillion of market cap as well. 
But uh, the market isn't very, very unidimensional like most other markets that we're familiar with, right? Whether it's the Indian stock market or the US stock market. Could you spend a little bit of time explaining to us some of the characteristics of the Chinese markets? And uh, within that, who are the players? Are, they, are these re retail players? Are these yeah. institutional players? If you could just walk us through that over the next few yeah. minutes, please. Uh, that's a really interesting question because um, you know China is very different from the rest of the world. So if I move on to the next page, just to give you some context of the size, uh, Supriya mentioned Shanghai and Shenzhen, the two big financial centers in China onshore, uh, they combine for around $11 trillion worth of market cap. Of course, some of these are state-owned enterprises and therefore they may not be what we call free float, but still, you know, from a market cap standpoint, it's, it's, it's big. And then you add in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong effectively nowadays is very much um, a Chinese company dominant market. That's around another $4 trillion. So from that angle, you can see that, you know, China and Hong Kong, and also don't forget there are companies listed, Chinese companies listed in New York and in other international markets. Uh, so, you know, there are, there, there, there are many ways to access you know, these Chinese companies. On the next page, um, it gives you a summary of what you could potentially uh, look into. So you've got onshore markets, uh, A shares. I think that's very much the, the mainstream. B shares are very much a legacy thing. Uh, it used to be a foreign currency uh, market, but frankly, very few people invest in that right now. Uh, offshore markets, H shares, red chips, those are based in Hong Kong. Overseas, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in New York, a lot of tech companies decide to list in New York. Um, so again, as, as well as in Singapore. So in that sense, there are many ways that an investor can access, uh, you know, your, your Chinese markets, whether it is directly into Shanghai and Shenzhen or in Hong Kong or other offshore centers. Now, in terms of the type of investors, on the next page, in Hong Kong is an international financial center, so it will be very similar to the likes of New York or in, 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 in London or in Tokyo, where you know, a lot is, is dominated by institutional investors, such as asset managers like ourselves. But in the onshore market in Shanghai, on the right-hand chart, you can see that individual investors is much bigger. And as a result of that, what you find is the volatility of the onshore market is typically much higher. There is a much bigger herd mentality, you know, if the news said, oh, you know, this week, this type of stock's going to do well, everyone's going to pile in. And then, you know, you went, we, you know, China went through a number of stock cycles. I remember the one in 2015, uh, you know, one of the gauges that we looked at whether the market was in a bubble was the number of new trading accounts open in China. And every time that there's a huge surge in stock trading accounts, you can almost sense that retail investors are going in and many of them are not familiar with investing and things don't go well. So from that perspective, I think from a liquidity standpoint, from a volatility standpoint, both the onshore market and the offshore markets have very, very different characteristics. And then in terms can I just, of the, please, can I just add, Ty, uh, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, part of the reason of this uh, skewed concentration of certain types of investors has to do with some legacy reasons, which is before uh, a few years back, uh, Asia's market or the onshore market was inaccessible by most foreign investors, which would typically be institutional investors. And therefore the only way for them to access Chinese companies would be through Hong Kong listed um, uh, H shares, or indeed to your point, some of these tech companies that are listed on the US exchanges. And therefore, because of some of those legacy reasons, the concentration of uh, onshore retail participation, the H shares a little bit more, which, understandably is changing, albeit gradually, because there is now the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, yeah. Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, which allows foreign investors to, to access these A shares through yeah. those stock exchanges. That's absolutely correct, Supreet. So, um, uh, well, again, just going to take a step back, there is a cap there's still some form of capital control going in and out of China. So, uh, you know, the Stock Connects uh, you mentioned, the qualified foreign institutional investor system where, you know, uh, again, asset managers such as ourselves, we can access China via Q fee, all of that, uh, that capital control effectively meant that 
the offshore markets like Hong Kong and, and, and New York, they are accessible to global investors and liquidity is easier to get in and out. But if you want to invest in China onshore, there are still some restrictions you know, within which obviously the stock connects is a very easy and free way for people to get in and out. But there is a certain uh, quote, uh, daily quotes of how much money can come in or out. Um, and as a result of that, what you find is the composition of uh, uh, companies onshore and offshore can be quite different. If you look at, for example, um, in the offshore market in Hong Kong, on the next page, what you find is uh, you have sort of the barbell. You've got the state-owned companies that were listed in the 2000s, your telecoms, your energy, your, your, your Chinese banks, uh, you know, they were the darling of the 2000s. In 2010s, that's when the tech companies, in this case, on left hand chart, communication services, uh, technology, those, those are the companies that are, are, are listed. So what you find is that uh, Hong Kong has a lot of the legacy old economy, but also a lot of new economy. The onshore market, what you find is that uh, lots of companies that are in retail, or uh, in a lot of the uh, sort of domestic demand, they quite often start listing in China onshore. So, you know, I think when you're looking to tap into the opportunity in China, uh, frankly, you need both, but it depends on your objective and your belief where China's economy is going to be. I think, you know, the onshore market and the offshore market can offer some of the different characteristics when it comes to investing in China. We'll dive a little bit deeper into this uh, discussion around state-owned enterprises versus private enterprises. When we speak uh, in detail about the Greater China Fund, we'll, we'll emphasize that we have quality growth investors. Mm -hmm. And a number of these uh, state-owned enterprises, because they serve the interest of their primary shareholder, shareholder, which is the state, isn't necessarily aligned to the quality uh, factor or the growth characteristics that we typically look for in several mm -hmm. of our uh, portfolio holdings. So we'll speak about that a little bit more as yeah, we walk sure. forward. Yeah, I think look, if you think about state and enterprises, um, you know, while there has been a number of attempts to improve the shareholder values, uh, their uh, emphasis on return on equities or dividends, uh, and to, to be fair, I think that some of them have gradually materialized. But at the same time, don't forget, you know, uh, state companies often have to perform certain social duties. So, for example, the banks, uh, when the economy is going through some difficult times, you know, they, they frankly, you know, if you look at, if you talk to the risk management uh, departments, they are very much aware of what needs to be done. But at the same time, if the government says, well, you know, we need to help certain parts of the economy, and the state banks typically will be at the forefront of that financial support. So I think, you know, from a risk management perspective, they're not just listening from the, to the government and just lending out money, you know, with no risk gauges, but at the same time, we have to be realistic that their profitability, uh, their return on equities could be somewhat impacted by a lot of these social obligations. So, you know, from that angle, think about that, again, you look, you go into an economic downturn, if you're an energy company or telecom company, you are downsized, you want to reduce your headcounts. It may not be as easy if you are staying in companies because you're going to make sure that, you know, the job market is not doing too badly. So I think that's where, you know, Supreme, you rightly mentioned, when we look at investing in China, uh, a lot of the private sector companies where they're innovative, uh, they are more cost conscious now. Um, and, you know, they do actually, uh, uh, I would say, put a higher priority on shareholder return and shareholder uh, uh, rights. Uh, and that's why I think from that perspective, still, despite the fact that growth may have somewhat underperformed in the recent past, I think in the longer term, it still makes sense um, for, for, for investors to focus more on the growth style rather than the defensive and the old economy uh, at this point. And the truth is, if you think back what the government does, and frankly, any government in the world wants to drive growth. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about some of the uh, sectors in, in the moment, but a lot of these are still going to be belonging to the growth sectors rather than these, uh, you know, more stable utilities, the you know, financial sectors. 
So, Tom, we've spent a little bit of time speaking about some of the challenges, headwinds. Uh, clearly, in the opening comments, uh, Shikhal has pointed out, and you did too, it's been a tough, tough time for Chinese equities. Uh, let's try and pivot a little bit towards uh, positive aspects of the market, mm -hmm. which is, you know, if one has to invest with a little bit of a positive investment thesis, yeah. what could invest or what could support such a positive investment thesis? Um, can I fast forward to page 14? The first thing I do want to bring up is that uh, this whole notion where China's GDP growth is coming down, that I agree with. Okay, if I look at our long-term capital market assumption, China's economic growth over the next 10, 15 years is going to be closer to 4% rather than 5, 6, 7%. However, I think linking GDP growth to investment return, the whole idea is flawed. And this, again, not just about China, is any economy in the world. The fact that U.S. has delivered consistently strong equity return to investors in the long run, despite growing a little bit slower than emerging markets, that's a great example. Because ultimately, when we invest in equities, we're investing in companies that makes profit. We're not investing in the economy. Yes, the economy growing faster may help, but as I'll show you one example in a moment, if the economy is growing very fast, but companies are not making money, that may not be the ideal scenario for investors. So I think the first myth I want to dispel is that if, even if China growth is decelerating for a number of reasons, it doesn't mean that this company will not be profitable. Likewise, you know, if you look back to the 2000s, China was growing extremely fast, but then at the same time, a lot of certain companies for various reasons, the earnings growth was mediocre. So this is the first thing I want to put out. The other thing I want to put out, from an opportunity standpoint on the next page, uh, China's always known for manufacturing, right? Uh, you know, the old days is clothing, footwear. Now it could be your mobile phones, your tablets. And to be fair, those are still the staples, but the importance of those are coming down. And at the same time, you know, with the U.S., relationship being quite challenging at times. Uh, China is looking to step up on self-sufficiency in key technology. So from that perspective, what this chart shows you is the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the horizontal axis shows you how difficult it is to develop some technology like CPU, like you know, uh, generating the highest quality of the highest specs of chips, that the barrier is very high. Uh, on the left-hand side, the barriers are quite low and you can see that China has already started to become more self-sufficient in those areas. So, you know, I think despite all the challenges in the macro economy, if we're able to pick out companies that can actually step up or contribute to their self-sufficiency and generating return and profit at the same time, that's a winner, right? The next example that I think is interesting is new, new energy vehicles or EVs on the next page. Uh, China is already uh, the biggest car exporter in the world. Uh, if you look at the charts here, I'll use the top left as an example. Uh, new vehicles, uh, new energy vehicles in use. Uh, China is now, well, back in 2022, I'm sure it's still the case now, it's more than Europe, US, and the rest of the world combined. Charging just stations. to that, uh, apologies, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, so it's interesting how uh, the largest manufacturer of electric vehicles is no longer Tesla, it's a Chinese company, BYD now, so yeah. that is a nice yeah. point that you're making, but apologies, please go ahead. Yeah, no, exactly, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to look into EVs myself, and uh, in Hong Kong, a few years ago, you want to get Tesla, you might have a couple of other brands, now is US, Europe, Chinese car makers, uh, you've got a much wider choice. But that said, I think it is also true that the industry is quite crowded. I can name at least 10 to 12, I'm sure there are more, Chinese EV brands, which I have to assume some of them will not be around in five years' time. So again, from a personal perspective, if I'm going to buy an EV today, I'm going to buy a brand that I think is going to be there in five years' time because I need to service it. Which also means that the competition on profitability it's going to be intense. So this is a good example about, you know, what I talked about earlier on about GDP growth versus profitability is that in this industry, I'm very optimistic. I think, you know, the industry as a whole globally is going to grow because everyone, or not everyone, but many people because of various reasons 
they may want um, electric vehicles. And many countries, especially in Europe, they're trying to face out internal com in, uh, combustion engines. But at the moment, the profitability of these companies is very challenging. So one way to get around this is actually to think about the component makers, the battery makers, those who built the robots to build the cars, because those manufacturers of the manufacturers, uh, the makers of the making, their profitability, I think, is better protected. So again, um, you know, the, the, the analogy often uses a theme park is great. You know, my kids, when they were younger, they loved going to theme parks. But if the theme park is crowded, that's not much fun. In fact, it's a very negative experience. You've got to queue for like two hours for one ride. In, one, in some ways, it's a very similar situation where the EV industry, I think, is extremely promising, but right now it's quite crowded. So let's think about what are the what are the contributors of this industry that we can invest in that can protect the profit margin, that are less competition. It may not be the car makers themselves. It could be the components makers. So I think that's where, um, I think, you know, despite all the challenges, all the problems that we've seen, uh, you know, these are some of the interesting opportunities that we see in China right now. Your analogy reminded me of an analogy that I very often use for uh, AI, since that's a little bit of a buzzword as well, which is if there is a gold rush of sorts in an industry, don't just buy the gold mining companies. Very often, the most successful companies are the companies that are selling uh, picks and shovels to those gold mining companies. So it ties in nicely with your example that don't just look at EV manufacturers, look at the supply chain, those people who make components and uh, you know the hardware and the software for the electric vehicles as well. Please continue. So obviously, look, the elephant in the room is the is the is the valuation. So if I can just fast forward to page eighteen, um, look, it's a bargain, right? I mean, you, you see this for yourself. It's, it's on the page. Now, I think the question that I often get asked is that many investors will see this as a tactical opportunity, and one number that I've been throwing out uh, in the last uh, last couple of days, I hope I don't jinx it, is that. <laughs> CSI 300 <laughs> is now outperforming FTSE 100 year to day. Um, and I think this is very much in relation to, because of the attractive valuations, we are attracting some bargain hunters uh, in, 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 into the market. And the truth is, if you look at uh, what you mentioned earlier, Supreme, about the, uh, the stock connect flows, we are seeing some flows into the Hong Kong market as far well as into the onshore market. Now, I think what is important for us as investors is not just to think about the tactical opportunities, but also some of the strategic longer term opportunities. And this is not with the stock index. So I think, uh, you know, uh, Sika mentioned right at the start, is it beta, is it alpha? I would argue that China is very much, you have to look for alpha. And because beta is, it comes and goes. And I think that's where the question becomes, how do I turn a tactical opportunity in the short term to a strategic opportunity in the long term? And stock picking is clearly one of them. The other thing I think, you know, two conditions is important for this to work in the long term. One is the property market starting to stabilize. Number two is that private businesses start to feel more optimistic and they start investing. So is it will require governments to be a bit more uh, transparent. It will require the governments to be providing a bit more certainty. And we've seen examples of that. So we've got more pro-growth policy, uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, for example, the gaming sector, um, you know, there were some rules about limiting time and money spent on gaming that was quickly reversed. So I think, you know, the government is very much aware that, you know, both the markets and the economy needs to do better. So. I think from that perspective, it, again, it's not an immediate U-turn or turnaround right now, but over the course of this year, I would expect gradual increase in policy support for the economy, and that should turn into a strategic opportunity to the markets. But back to my point, this is going to be very much about stock picking, trying to generate that alpha, even though beta will still be okay, but to me, the alpha generation is the is the key piece in investing in China. I very often uh, remind investors and advisors that you will never get two things together, which is good news and good valuations. That's just not how the world functions, and certainly not how the markets function. So, if you have good news, 
you will have to reconcile with some not attractive valuations. Let's take an example of the tech cohort in the US. Mm. Um, great news, and particularly very strong news around AI, but well, you could argue valuations aren't the most attractive right now. On the other side of the spectrum is a market like China. Plenty of bad news. I think we can have a three, four hour call just discussing the magnitude and the quantum of the bad news. Mm -hmm. However, the one good news that you do see in this market is that the valuations are historically cheap. And while you were speaking, Ty, I was just paying attention to this graph. The Chinese markets, as per this chart, were, were as cheap as they are today, only three other times in the past 20 years. One was obviously during COVID, uh, 2011 and 2008 in the depths of the global financial crisis. Yeah. And we all know that, uh, you know, and I don't need to remind you who said this, when everybody's fearful, it's time to be a little more positive in that market as well. So maybe perhaps yeah. while it's possible to point out and time or, um, or to specify when the bottom of the market has hit, uh, we would argue that uh, just from a risk reward perspective, this market is looking extremely uh, skewed asymmetrically towards yeah. rewards rather than the risk and risk always remain. Yeah. So I do want to touch upon one of the risks, which is just around politics. Now it's well known that, you know, policy is in the hands of very few people and clearly policy can upend economic and certainly corporate performance as well. Uh, is corporate China able to navigate that? And there are pockets which are able to still prosper? I think so. I think uh, the tech sector is a great example. Um, as I mentioned earlier in 2021, the government came down with a number of things uh, that created a lot of pressure on the tech sector. Frankly, the education sector, the after school tutorial got wiped out over the weekend. Uh, and then the, uh, a lot of the e-commerce giants, I can't name names, but you know who they are. Uh, they also went through quite a bit of a, uh, a challenging time. But the truth is, you know, these guys, the, the reason why you invest, invest in them is because they are creative, they're nimble, uh, and they were able to adjust to the environment. So a lot of these e-commerce giants, what they did was, um, you know, when they first started, they were willing to give away money to attract user, to attract market share, to get market share. Um, right now, what they're doing is, well, you know, they, they become much more conscious on cost control. They're much more conscious about return on investment. And you know, kudos, uh, their profit margin has improved, even though top line is yet to get back to where we were before COVID. So I think um, the reality is, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're just a startup, maybe the current environment will put you off to some extent. But for a lot of the more seasoned, larger companies, quality companies, uh, you know, they are able to navigate uh, the, the, the policy environment it's always challenging and that's not, again, not unique in China, anywhere else. You can have a lot of policy being thrown about. Uh, but I think the best companies with the best management, what they can do is to, you know, again, I think you had a great example, great analogy in the past, adjusting your sale uh, to make sure that it's facing the wind in the right way. Uh, and I think we see that happening. The macro environment is challenging, but once you have the macro, the, uh, the management adjustments all lined up, I do think they they should have a much better time. And again, I completely agree with you. You know, good news, you don't get good valuations. And this is very much a time when good valuations play or attractive valuations could play a really important role. Um, one last point, I, I sort of bring this up and um, you mentioned earlier, valuations at, at the extremes, either too expensive or too cheap, it does not necessarily imply that it's a sell or a buy. But to me, it's very much a flag that, hey, you really should take a look. So. US things are a bit expensive and you know we are looking into does that is that sensible is that reasonable compared to history is something wrong likewise in China valuation extremely cheap it doesn't mean I just go in blindingly but I will look okay what are some of the issues or challenges that the economy is facing how much of that is structural how much of that is cyclical um, you know another question I get asked a lot is geopolitics uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the elections in November. We, we, I'm sure we'll have a call about that later on. But I would argue that a lot of the challenges, potential challenges between US and China is partially reflected, maybe a lot of that reflected in this valuation. I would argue a lot of the risks that US with its allies that could have, that's not in a valuation. So, you know, I, I get asked all the time, 
US-China relationship. Um, look, we don't know what's going to happen. Things can get really bad, or things can just stay where it is. But I would argue that the non-extreme scenarios, a lot of that is, is arguably already uh, being reflected in valuations. It's a good point, because going into the next few weeks, uh, we certainly expect uh, rhetoric or political rhetoric to reach fever pitch, particularly in the US. It's not, it's not going to be impossible to hear rhetoric such as America first, uh, bring manufacturing back again, and so on and yep. so forth. So that could lead to some volatility as well. And that's important to highlight when you're thinking about risks in emerging markets, particularly in markets such as China as well. Okay, uh, time to switch gears. We've covered a fair amount of ground in terms of explaining the reasons why the market struggled. Uh, we've, we've tried to understand the characteristics of the equity markets, which is quite different, the onshore, offshore characteristics. We've also tried to discover what could lead to a change in the economic and the market uh, behavior as well with regards to performance. And finally, uh, Ty did discuss the changing characteristics of the economy, how it's from being a manufacturer of commoditized products globally, it is becoming more tech savvy, uh, leading the charge in many fields like let's say renewables or for that matter, electric vehicles. And finally, we touched upon a very important fundamental point on valuations as well. So. Maybe I take this opportunity to spend the next 10 minutes on the Greater China Funds. If you jump forward two slides, um, I want to acknowledge the performance right at the front. So let's start with the top half. The top half is showing you point-to-point -point returns of the JP Morgan Fund. So these are in US dollar terms. So whether you look at one-year performance, three-year performance, clearly in absolute sense, uh, negative but also in terms of performance relative to the benchmark, and the benchmark here is the MSCI Golden Dragon Index. Remember, this, is, this, is, this includes not just China, but also Taiwan and Hong Kong. Even if we assume Hong Kong is a proxy for China, there is 30, 35% in Taiwan in the benchmark as well. So you notice that uh, the fund has underperformed the benchmark over three years, one year, although it continues to outperform the benchmark across longer periods of time, whether it's five years, 10 years, since launch, uh, which, which goes back uh, almost a decade and a half in India, because this was launched back in 2009, if I remember my history correctly. Uh, I also want to point out the bottom half of this slide, which is showing you calendar year performance. So again, 2023 tough year for the strategy, the, the benchmark was flat, while we lost about eight and a half relative to the ben benchmark, 2022, 2021, both tough here for the markets, albeit we lost uh, we lost alpha, delivered negative performance relative to the benchmark to the tune of about 8.22% in the year of 2022 as well. So two tough years, which is kind of uh, eaten into the cumulative performance of three years, which is in analyzed terms, while you know, five year, 10 years since launch analyzed performance is still uh, pos uh, positive as well as outperforming the benchmark as well. And I wanna spend a little bit of time with that and tie in what uh, Ty spoke about in his earlier comments when he was explaining the markets and the characteristics of the, characteristics of the market. So if you jump forward uh, one slide, let me first of all acknowledge the philosophy of this fund. Now, we all acknowledge this is a very important emerging market, but it is a volatile asset class. First of all, you have to take an active approach and we we'll speak about why that is important and you have to be long-term and ultimately we bottom up investors in this. I acknowledge very early on, uh, while Ty was making his comments about state-owned enterprises, that we at JP Morgan Asset Management, particularly for the Greater China Fund, are very specifically and consistently growth-oriented investors with a specific focus on higher quality companies. And within that, we apply, employ a high conviction approach. So even though there are eight, 900 uh, stocks in the benchmark or thereabouts, um, we do own only about 60, 65 stocks in the portfolio. So we really employ our conviction of kicking the tires on the ground, having our research team and the research team being 15 team members strong and a very, very well uh, staffed portfolio management team that's been doing this for two and a half decades now. So, you know, we really have been present in the market and ultimately we bottom up investors that focus on fundamental and uh, stock selection using our own proprietary research as well. So remember those terms, growth oriented and quality as well. If you go to the next slide, uh, and uh, let's just try and explain what's happened in the market and why we've delivered negative alpha and underperformed the uh, benchmark. So 2023 is a classic example of what went on in the market. So on the left-hand side, we're showing you the breakup of just MSCI China. 
Granted, this is a greater China fund, but let's just focus on China because that's almost 95% reason or almost 100% reason of the underperformance of the strategy. So if you notice the only sector that was positive in MSCI China in 2023 was energy. And the sectors that have more quality and growth oriented characteristics, whether it's information technology, consumer discretionary, healthcare, a lot of them were significantly negative anywhere between high double digits to um, or high teens to uh, high single digits as well. And um, what you will notice is some of the text on the bottom that uh, it's not just a tough year and we're not trying to hide behind other managers, but even if you were to look at the peer group, even the, the last person in the top quartile underperformed MSCI China because of this characteristic of the market, which is the only style that did well was energy in that year. And energy, as we explained, does get dominated by state-owned enterprises, almost to the tune of 90, 95% of energy companies in the benchmark are state-owned enterprises. Some of the other companies which are on the top of this uh, and have done relatively well compared to uh, growth sectors are uh, utilities, financials, et cetera, which again are a part of more value slash not a part of uh, the quality cohort that we like to like to focus on. So. This period of 2023 and 2022 was generous to the style of value and also the, to the style of low quality equities that did well. And if you go to the next, uh, next slide, you will see some more evidence of that. So on the left-hand side, we're showing you uh, three basic cohorts. So whether it's value cyclical in the red line or whether it's yield oriented, which is high dividend yielding companies, they've clearly outperformed the cohort of more uh, growth oriented, which is in the turquoise slash blue line. So you notice since 2021, which is when that style peaked, the last couple of years have been pretty particularly brutal to that style of growth investing. And what's really done well in that period of time is this low quality, more cyclical slash value rally, which explains the underperformance to a large degree as well. Now it's not to say that uh, we don't still find opportunities. We are, unapologetically uh, loyal to our focus and our investment theme of staying with quality and staying growth oriented. And we do find opportunities, whether it's in technology, carbon neutrality, as well as consumption. I'll shed a little bit, a little bit of light on uh, two specific ones, whether it's technology and carbon neutrality as well. Next slide, I won't spend time on it. Uh, Ty very, very uh, eloquently articulated the opportunity in terms of valuation, but I wanna focus on the next slide which quantifies the, the magnitude and the time period of this drawdown. Uh, please ignore the top half, focus on the bottom half, which is showing you historical drawdowns in China. The one that we are in the middle of, or we were at least in the middle of till, uh, till earlier this, uh, this month, was the one on the extreme right. You will notice both in terms of the magnitude, as well as in terms of time horizon, it is actually at par or greater than the, than the drawdown and the period that we saw exactly 20 years back between 2000 to 2003. So, you know, in the past 20 years, we haven't seen this quantum and, and the time period of correction in the, in the Chinese market, which also goes to explain the relative poor underperformance in absolute terms. And as I explained in relative terms, because of the growth and the quality characteristics of the portfolio. The next slide explains some of the characteristics of the portfolio as of today. So let's walk you step by step. Please focus on the table on the left-hand side. First of all, a P multiple, a good gauge of valuations. Uh, the portfolio is now trading at 13.2 times. We are paying a slight premium compared to the benchmark because we do inherently focus on quality and growth companies. And we don't mind paying a premium for that relative to the benchmark, which has a heavy concentration of several state-owned enterprises which we wouldn't want to own. Even if it's price to book, again, a very reasonable price to book of two times. And by the way, I just want to contextualize 13.2 in a world where it's, un it's not uncommon to find markets trading upwards of 20, 25 because of the characteristics which are well, very well known to all of us as well. Um, what I want to focus on next is the third row from the bottom, which speaks about the five-year expected growth rate. This five-year expected growth rate is the JP Morgan Asset Management proprietary estimates of its portfolio's growth, earnings growth, 
compounded over the next five years. So we look at those 62 companies, which are 61 companies which are in the portfolio, and we estimate through our own research, remember those 15 research analysts and the portfolio management team, we have our expected return framework, and that to us is telling us that our portfolio uh, companies are expected to grow at an annualized rate of 17.7%. Remember what I said, we're happy to pay a premium to buy high quality and growth companies, and you clearly see that reflecting in our uh, superior expected growth compared to the benchmark, which is at about 13 and a half times. And ultimately, the number of stocks that we own in the portfolio is about 61, reflecting our uh, high conviction approach. Uh, top right hand side is showing you our focus around quality and premium companies. The way to think about premium is the next level, which is it's even higher than the quality companies. So the highest quality companies are treated as premium companies in our strategic classification. And we tend to have less than significantly less than the benchmark in, in non high quality companies, which are called either standard or challenge. While the benchmark has more than half in it, we only have about 32.2% in that. And in terms of market cap breakup, you can see the slide on the bottom side as well. Just going to the next slide to try and explain where we are invested in terms of sectors. I wanna, I wanna emphasize this portfolio is not a top-down portfolio. It's a bottom-up stock selection portfolio. So what you see here, is a result of that approach. We don't start by deciding on how much weight in, a, in an index or, or sorry, in a sector or a, or a market. This is the result of a bottom-up approach. So unsurprisingly, since I've mentioned growth quality multiple times, you wouldn't be surprised that we have bulk of our portfolio, which is about 35% in information technology, followed by sectors such as consumer service, um, consumer discretionary, and some of the others. So uh, for instance, our biggest underweight is in financials, which is even though it's 13 and a half percent of our portfolio is underweight relative to the benchmark by about 5.1%. And those yellow bars on the top are showing you the sub components or the subsectors of that financial. So we particularly underweight banks, where we under, under own uh, state owned banks, which is about 6.7% underweight relative to the benchmark. And we slightly overweight in terms of diversified financial services. Just casting our eyes on market positions, which are in the bottom half, China is 56% of the portfolio. But again, those yellow bars show you which part of China. Remember what we said, there is an A-shares onshore market. That is about 18.2% of the portfolio, which is an overweight relative to the benchmark by about 11%. Almost 38% of the uh, Chinese allocation is in others, which includes edge shares as well as the offshore listed. Uh, that is uh, an underweight of about 8.7%. Hong Kong, almost neutral to the benchmark at about 9.5%. Taiwan's at about 34%, again, almost neutral to the benchmark as well. So that's the way to look at uh, this portfolio. Uh, next slide shows you some of the top holdings as of end of December. Some very familiar names, TSMC, one of the most important semiconductor companies, done very well. Therefore, uh, our Taiwan positions added positive alpha while China's lost money. And some of the reasons we've lost money, it's stocks such as uh, Netuan and some of the other uh, names as well. But we do own uh, Tencent, uh, AIA, which is a very high quality regional, Asia regional insurance and financial uh, major, Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing, which is the beneficiary of anybody who wants to trade Chinese equities as the trade uh, volume pick up the benefit. Syllogy is a semiconductor stock. Again, uh, you know, speaking to the comments that I made about China focusing on high quality that benefits from it. NetEase, uh, uh, a more of gaming slash technology company and China Merchants Bank, a high quality state owned bank. Uh, you see some top five underweights on the right hand side. Uh, you'd be surprised to see TSMC is an underweight. That's merely because our fund guidelines don't allow us to own more than 10% in a single stock. And you'll notice TSMC is almost hitting that 10% and the benchmark actually has almost 4.5% additional at about uh, 14% and we clearly can't go up to 14%, which is why TSMC tends to be an underweight just because of that technical reason. Otherwise, we are we do like the stock quite a lot as well. Alibaba is an underweight as is uh, Pinduoduo. Just a quick look on the next slide uh, and I'll promise I'll wrap this up and open it up for Q&A very soon. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, performance attribution. Taiwan, as I mentioned, contributed positively to performance, whereas China detracted, particularly stock selection in China because of our bias towards quality and growth. And remember what I said, it's more uh, low quality cyclical value stocks that were that did reasonably well in China in that period of time. 
The next slide uh, just shows you some stock attribution, which I spoke about, won't spend too much time on this, but top 10 detractors on the right-hand side, a lot of those growth companies, whether it's tech, Meituan, um, which is more a consumer tech company, Pinduoduo, uh, healthcare, growth healthcare company like Wuxi Biologics, which is, a, which is a leading contract research outsourcing company. Um, so that, uh, if we could jump forward to slide 37, and uh, maybe I'll leave it there. Uh, we do continue to find number of opportunities in China. This is a different China from what many people are familiar with. We find opportunities in the space of technology and technology for Chinese consumers and businesses. Uh, China is leading the charge when it comes to car carbon neutrality with the conviction and commitment of going net, uh, net zero in terms of carbon emissions by 2060. And also, this is the second most populous nation. It is an emerging market where per capita in, uh, uh, GDP is now upwards of $10,300. So it's become a middle-income country, which means there are there is a vast swath of uh, middle-income uh, consumers who have money to spend. And as Ty focused in his presentation, have saved that money, even though consumer sentiments are relatively weak right now, we do find opportunities. The next uh, couple of slides, uh, let's go to the next one. This, uh, and I'll let you look at it at your leisure. These are some of the areas that we find opportunities in technology, clearly semiconductors. AI is not just a trend in the US. It's, it's something which you will expect China to catch up or certainly try to catch up as well. We do find a number of opportunities there. Uh, China is again, no longer a low cost manufacturer. They are automating, putting more robots instead of people. And we find stocks such as Shenzhen on Innovents as a major leader and ultimately software. Microsoft Office is not what is predominantly used in China. It's Kingsoft software and so on and so forth. So many uh, technology companies not exporting to the rest of the world, but really for Chinese consumers and businesses as well. And the next slide, and I'll promise to leave it there very soon, is about um, opportunities in carbon neutrality. So solar, which is where China is a leader, transformation of old companies. So, you know, old steel companies that are really dirty companies when it comes to carbon emissions, trying to get them to become more carbon neutral, names such as Shanghai, Shanghai Biosite, which used to be a traditional old school steel manufacturer and really evolving more as a leader in sustainable uh, manufacturing. And finally, uh, to the point that Ty made about China being a leader in electric vehicles and my analogy of don't just buy the gold mining company, but even the companies that sell picks and shovels to those companies. Ningbu Toku is a, is a leading OEM manufacturer that actually makes uh, auto parts for electric, electric vehicle manufacturers, whether it's uh, uh, software, hardware, uh, you know, and, and electric uh, guidance systems, radar systems, and so on. So as penetration of those electric vehicle improves, the, the uptake of some of these OEM manufacturer picks up as well. Great, uh, we've covered a lot of ground and hopefully this gives you a sense of the economic background, the fund. Hopefully we've tried to explain the reasons of the underperformance and we can, our conviction continues in the growth and the quality characteristics of this market. And uh, you know, we, we do believe both from a valuation as well as the point of view of uh, technicals, which is the participation of uh, you know, investors, whether it's overseas or for retail investors, it's an interesting point. And we certainly hope we've been able to give you an insightful uh, peek into both the market, the economy, as well as the opportunity through the Greater China, uh, Edelweiss Greater China Fund. With that, uh, let me pass it over to uh, Shikha. Thank you. Thank you, Tai and Supri. That was a very insightful session, I must say. And we did get a lot of questions. Uh, but thanks, uh, Supreet, for taking them up uh, during the call itself. And I believe a lot of them have been answered. Uh, and we've almost reached, we're almost time up, but probably we can take one or more questions. So uh, participants, please feel free to post your questions uh, in the chat box. If uh, time permits, we would definitely uh, take it up during the call or we would address them separately once the call is done. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Thai, if I may request you uh, to quickly summarize, if you could stitch it all together for us and uh, from a macro perspective. So uh, what are probably the three things that you're looking at uh, in the China market that can drive uh, uh, that can drive returns for investors this year? Yeah, I think uh, three things. Number one, it's obviously uh, some improvement in a macro environment. So I'll be looking out for, for example, uh, the... Uh, real estate activity starting to stabilize. We start to see some stabilization in home prices. That to me is the key. 
Um, and at the same time, uh, more consistent performance in consumption because we usually get some really good results during holiday seasons. For example, the Lunar New Year holiday just passed, uh, but hopefully between holidays, we continue to see consumers start to pick up again. So that's the first thing, the macro environment. Number two, it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, business confidence. And this one is a bit more difficult to gauge quantitatively uh, unless you look at the business investment. But you know, we speak with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in China. Uh, we have a private bank in Hong Kong. Many of these are, uh, the clients are also Chinese entrepreneurs. So from that perspective, you know, we do get a lot of uh, real-time feedback uh, from our clients, from our contacts on how things are improving. Uh, that to me is going to be critical. The final thing is, um, again, back to investor sentiment. Now, uh, in the last couple of years, I've spoken to a lot of investors around the world about China, and I'm being honest, and a lot of US, European investors, they do worry about geopolitics, but increasingly, they are not the only people that invest in China. A lot of emerging market investors in India, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, they all invest in China. I think the key here is, if we start to see some momentum of capital flow into Hong Kong, into the onshore market, and that start to reinforce itself, I think that's going to be a really important turnaround for the Chinese markets. Again, I think it's not something that's going to happen overnight. We do require some patience, but given valuation, given positioning, you know, if you choose to invest in China right now, I would argue that uh, this is actually a pretty good opportunity as an entry point uh, to start accumulating your Chinese allocation. Okay, that's great. So uh, largely property market stabilization uh, and it's a uh, knock-on effect on consumption and therefore uh, 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 the consumer uh, sentiment. And uh, the second point you mentioned about uh, private business investment and the third, of course, improving investor sentiment, therefore, with the all the initiatives that are being taken across and the new investment opportunities uh, in the China market. So, uh, Supreet, uh, my one question to you, if you could accordingly stitch that uh, to how our portfolio is currently positioned and uh, how is the portfolio essentially taking advantage from the structural as well as any cyclical uh, opportunities? Yeah, sure, Shikha. And uh, I want to emphasize again, we are a bottom-up stock investor. Um, so if we go to slide number 27, you'll see our focus is really around the biggest areas of growth and quality. Uh, so let's focus on real estate. For instance, uh, the real estate portfolio, and this is as of 31st of January, so this is the latest portfolio, uh, we're just 3.5% of the benchmark. And a lot of these real estate exposure is actually uh, real estate property management companies rather than just standalone real estate construction development uh, companies as well. So. Um, that's where you see just a three and a half percent allocation reflecting our bias more towards more growth, growth and quality parts of the of the uh, of the Chinese market, and inevitably we find a lot of those quality and growth characteristics in companies in tech, uh, communication services. Believe it or not, Tencent is qualified as uh, or classified as communication services because of the diversified business it has, but even consumer discretionary. Again, we like many consumer discretionary companies, but again, um, you know, that slight underweight of 3% that you see relative to the benchmark is a reflection of that bottom-up approach again. So, Shiga, I must admit that we don't approach it from a macro perspective. Uh, of course, our, our analysis of every stock that we own in the portfolio, it's, it's a sum total of not just the company fundamentals, but also the fundamentals of the economy, whether it's supportive for that company and the earnings outlook. But the primary driver of our decision is a stock specific bottom up ideas rather than a top down macro view. So uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily do justice to your question on whether I can stitch it together to the macro macro environment. Sure, uh, fair enough, Supreet. Uh, thanks for those details. Uh, we've got, uh, I'm going to probably uh, compile the questions around uh, whether it's a good time to invest more. Think of averaging basis the current uh, uh, valuation levels or uh, probably just go on, uh, just invest lump sum uh, in the fund. So what would be your suggestion? I can never argue against systematic investing or uh, you know regular investing. Dollar cost averaging will always spread your risk over a period of time. Uh, listen, we can speak to uh, the opportunity that exists today. Um, 
if Ty and I could answer whether this is the best time, we'd be probably be sitting on our private islands of our own, sitting up Pina Colada right now. But uh, the reality is we don't. And uh, I will acknowledge that we, we don't necessarily specialize in market timing. So I'll leave that decision to you. Uh, please, please do pay emphasis to the comments that Ty and I have made, which is purely from a risk reward perspective, the market is leaning a lot more towards reward. There are risks, so nobody's saying it's, we, we can't time the bottom, we can't time the top, but uh, just from car characteristics of the market, the amount of negativity and just the valuations, uh, it is leading us uh, towards being more positive on a risk reward basis, more towards reward. So whether you wanna capture this opportunity through lump sum investments, or you want to capture it through a more systematic investment is really an individual choice. It's also a reflection of your risk taking ability and your time horizon. So I'd leave the decision up to you because you'd be in a much better position to take that decision. Can I just add something very quickly for 30 seconds? I think um, obviously everyone on this call and your clients are heavily invested in the Indian market, which I'm also very optimistic about. But at the same time, I think there are some uh, areas where, you know, if you invest in India uh, and invest in China, they will complement each other. So I think, you know, from an infrastructure, from a manufacturing standpoint, there are clearly huge opportunities in India over the course of the next five to 10 years. But at the same time, many of the industries that we discussed today, uh, for now, uh, they are not present as an opportunity set in India. So uh, I, I understand the psychology of trying to be there uh, at the bottom or you get out of the top, but from a portfolio construction perspective, I think the investment case for China is not so much it's just cheap, but also some of the industries that just by investing in India, you may not have access to. So that's another thing to think about. Thanks, Ty. In fact, uh, one of the questions that we had also received is, um, when India is looking so good, so why consider China? So of course, as a complementary play, <laughs> Companies or sectors that are available in India may not be available in China, and of course the other way around as well. So thanks for that. Uh, no, can so I can I'm, I just say can I just say please yeah. don't look at this as a as a replacement for India. Mm. Uh, you know, look at this as diversification. Uh, there are different le levers that and different uh, characteristics of the market. It's not competition at all. As Ty mentioned, it's complementary. So please don't consider this as competition to India. Um, you know, it, it's it's got different characteristics. Its market valuations are historically low. India, you know, obviously is a growth market, so you know valuations aren't necessarily the most attractive. They're not rich, understandably, but they're not attractive. And to Ty's point, some of these opportunities you just don't find, uh, or you're just not able to monetize today in Indian market. So it's quite complementary and not competition. Sure. Thanks, Supreet. And uh, Supreet and I, would it be okay if we extend the call by another five minutes? I can see that we are receiving a lot of questions, but probably we can just uh, take uh, last two, if that's okay. Sure. sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So just combining uh, two points around risk. So one, the deflation, and uh, second on uh, aging. So what would you say about that? Uh, I'll, I'll start with aging. Um, everyone's got an aging problem. I know that you know India has got a very young population, uh, and your population allowed to grow. But I think if you look at a lot of the other economies, both developed and emerging markets, everyone's got an aging problem. And at the same time, you know, uh, a population that's shrinking, it doesn't have to be problematic because again, it comes back to my point about GDP growth. We're looking to invest in profitable companies. We're not investing in more population or, or higher GDP if companies are not making money. So in that sense, I mean, I'll just digress for 10 seconds. Think about Japan, huge population issue, huge demographic issue. But if you invest in healthcare for, for, the, old, for the elderly, um, you know, the, the, the adult diaper industry, for example, I mean, that sort of symbolized the opportunity set you could capture even with a demographic that's not particularly favorable. So from that perspective, it's very much about you know, back to Supreet's point, which companies will be able to capture or benefit from this demographic trend? Is it robotics because, you know, we're having fewer people working in the factories or getting more expensive? Uh, or healthcare because more older people will require them. Um, deflation to me, again, the data tells me that a lot of that is because of food prices, which is not uh, necessarily a macro issue, it's more a supply side issue, but it is true that inflation is not a problem compared to what we've seen in the US 
or in Europe, because as you saw earlier on, demand is relatively soft. So I think from that perspective, uh, if the economy starts to improve, I would expect inflation pressure to come back to some extent. But at the same time, I know we don't want too high inflation. We, do, we don't want deflation. But at this point, at least the low inflation environment allows central banks to keep policy rates low. And they still have a bit more room to cut as well, which obviously can help the economy and also the markets. Sure. Thanks, sir. Uh, one another point around, uh, so we also have funds that are feeding into JP Morgan emerging markets and also JP Morgan ASEAN funds. Uh, any quick view on the two funds in case anybody would like to take exposure to China through the emerging market fund and also separately on the ASEAN fund? Uh, it really depends on the approach you want to take. If you want to take a more diversified uh, approach towards emerging markets, clearly that's the emerging market fund because you have to then recognize it's not a pure play on China because again, emerging market fund will have, uh, let's say, a big concentration on China to the tune of let's say 35, 40%. But you will find some of the other markets such as Taiwan, Korea, India, and I don't know if you want to necessarily allocate 14, 15, 20% in India through an EM manager sitting in London or somewhere else when you have clearly great capabilities from local managers such as Edelweiss and others in India and some of the Latin American uh, countries as well. So uh, to me, it really depends on how do you want to approach it. If you want a pure play uh, approach to this uh, dynamic, exciting region, uh, you know, there is the Greater China Fund, but if you'd like to take it through a more diversified uh, fund, and obviously the trade-off is if China, China does recover and recovers uh, significantly, the returns are obviously going to be captured to the tune of the allocation of China in an emerging market fund. The, trade the other trade-off is diversification always helps in case the investment thesis in one or two market doesn't work. At least you're diversified across a broader set of companies. So that really is an approach that you'd like to, uh, uh, to, to analyze yourself. Uh, with regards to the ASEAN fund, uh, you know, I'll leave it to Thai, but uh, we also believe that's an opportunity that exists. Clearly, that market has seen more outflows from foreign investors over a long period of time. And uh, to us, it's under-owned, under-appreciated. And, and again, uh, just as an economic block, it is the fifth largest economic block. And there are plenty of opportunities across financial services. And many of the themes are actually quite similar to themes in India. So financial penetration and economies such as Indonesia opens up several opportunities. There are really high quality banks in Singapore and uh, you know, a few opportunities across uh, Vietnam that we capture, which is clearly a, a very young emerging market as well as uh, in Malaysia as well. But Ty, any comments on those? No, I, I think, uh, I mean, that's for another hour worth of discussion on, on ASEAN, but I do agree with you, Safri, that there are lots of characteristics in ASEAN uh, that's quite similar uh, to, um, to India. You know, both uh, India and ASEAN, they are aspiring to be uh, growing, expanding their manufacturing capability. There's clearly a lot of infrastructure opportunities there. Obviously, in ASEAN, in markets like Indonesia, commodities is going to be another potential driver uh, to growth. But at the same time, you then expose yourself to some uh, commodity price volatility as well. So uh, again, it's about diversification. Um, I think the valuations in China is still relatively more attractive than India uh, than, than, than ASEAN as of, as of now. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, for me, Asia this year is going to be about export recovery, uh, where ASEAN does play a role. It may not be as uh, clear as an opportunity compared to, say, Taiwan or even you know, Chinese exports. We're starting to see some strong improvement in those export numbers. So again, I think it's a, it's a part of a package for the whole of Asia. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, I'll probably prioritize China over ASEAN uh, if I need to um, you know, pace myself in, in allocating within Asia. Sure, thanks. One last question. Uh, so we've seen that uh, FDI flows into China have been increasing. On the other hand, FII flows into the equity markets, the listed shares uh, have been reducing, or in fact, we've been seeing uh, outflows. So what is the kind of risk that we see from uh, even reduction in uh, MSCI weightages into China hmm. uh, for uh, uh, the recovery going ahead? Yeah, I think, again, um, you know, what we've discussed, the, the, the macro environment, the policy environment, the geopolitical environment in the last few years have clearly put um, you know, some question marks over China from an international investor standpoint. But I think the truth is, if we start to see some improvements in the macro data, 
uh, you should expect the FII flow start to improve again. It may not be back to the heydays of you know the late 2010s or you know early 2020s, but at the same time, you know when we speak with a lot of international investors, again we often think of just the U.S. and Europeans, but the truth is. Uh, Middle East investors, Latin investors, ASEAN investors, they're becoming much more uh, willing to diversify. Uh, and from that perspective, I think that, you know, once uh, China is proved to be able to deliver return to investors, I think that momentum could well build. So uh, from that angle, uh, FI flows tends to be very fickle. It comes and goes very quickly. Um, so I wouldn't be overly concerned if anything. Uh, outflow to me, it's a sign of investors the, the, you know, the fear and greed factors kicking in. And you know, the, the old saying is often is if investors are worried about something, maybe that's not an, a, bad, a bad entry point for a particular market. So with that, uh, I think I'd like to conclude the session. Uh, thank you very much, Ty and Supreet. Uh, the number of questions that we've received uh, is surely a testimony to the interest that we are seeing here in India across advisors and investors as well. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And thank you, participants, for logging. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.